Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, that we might understand and hear your heart cry. We thank you for all that you want to do in our lives, through our lives, because of your life. We give you praise, honor, and glory, and everyone said, amen. I want to talk to you and continue on with this series called This Gospel. We've shared so much from many different angles, but for the last couple of weeks, if you've not been with us, we've been talking about the, the, the absolute importance of understanding your part in this gospel. Jesus said, of course, our foundation passage is from Matthew chapter 24. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. That means every people group. You don't have to literally go to nations, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then the end will come. Well, much has been shared about that thus far. Paul the Apostle said in Romans 1.17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, the Jew first and also the Gentile, for in it, verse 17 says, the righteousness in it, in the gospel, the righteousness is revealed to, uh, unto us from faith to faith. Amen? Amen? But it's for that very reason that I want to really have hearts awakened here for our part the part that you play the part that you play whether you're in the military the part that you play whether you're a, you know you're a say uh, at home mom or dad the part that you play whether you're in the corporate world or whatever wherever it may be that God has you that's your sphere of influence because we are the voice the church to preach the gospel and the gospel is the best news anybody could ever hear when they hear the story of Jesus and they hear the story of how he transformed your life, boy, they're just going to be compelled to understand more of the person, not a religion, but of a person, not a ritual, of a person by the name of Jesus. You know, and, um, and for that reason, in, this, in the context, is catching people up. We, we brought to your attention a number of weeks ago that God says to every person in the body of Christ, Tag your it. Tell your neighbor, tag your it. Say, I'm it for my generation. That's right. We talked about how we've been tagged by God and we are it. Tagged represents transformed for the letter T, for the letter A, it's anointed. For the first letter in uh, the word tagged, for G, it's graced. Second G is gifted. Uh, the letter E in the word tagged would be empowered. And the letter D is destined. Destined to fulfill the Great Commission. Say, tag, I'm it. Tag. Say it louder. Tag. Say it louder. Tag. Now turn your neighbor and say, tag, you're it. Tag. No, no, see, y'all got to throw something on it. You got to put some little salsa on the things. You go, tag, you're it. Tag. Uh, oh, yeah. You got to throw out the you and say, oh, yo, tag, you're it. Oh, man. See, that's why I went to school. So I, I went to university, graduated, so I could say, yo, yo it. Uh, you don't care. <laughs> and that's why Paul the Apostle said to our example, a man by the name of Archippus, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Archippus. And I said to all of us that were with us, we are all Archippus. Take heed. Pay attention, focus on, give your focus to the ministry that you have received from the Lord that you might fulfill it. This was not what's called a five-fold office, not an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. But as a believer, as a believer like yourself, we all have a part to play in preaching this gospel or being part of the ministry. Can I have an amen? amen. And I said that if we don't fulfill this ministry then someone's going to be left out. And that's why I gave you the phrase, somebody is waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. Everyone read that out loud with me. Ready, read. Somebody is waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. Let's make it personal. Ready, read it. Somebody is waiting for me on the other side of my obedience. Let's try that again. Somebody is waiting for me on the other side of my obedience. I truly believe that. And so God knows that. God knows that when we come to him with the power, the life that he has given us, that we don't necessarily 
get it at first, and it sometimes takes a process of time to understand that, but he truly wants to know how important you are, the value you carry, the worth you have, and the posit he has already made on the inside of you. And so we often make this declaration. Uh, the Bible that, uh, it declares over us three important things. I am what the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. It's great to declare that in here, safe zone. But God wants us not only to declare it, but he wants us to be the gospel. He wants us to be good news. He wants us to be the kind of Christians that understands the value of one person. Not only your value, but the value of every person. And this morning, I want us to, to understand that no matter where you live, whether it's California or whether it's in Asia or whether it's in Europe, you know, or in different parts of the world, every one person matters to God. And that importance is never lost. It's never lost. And sometimes we have to kind of remind ourselves. Let me give you a verse of scripture to kind of help you to understand before I bounce into something here this morning. From Psalm 72. Let's see if we can roll that up, Lex. Let's see if we can get that on the screen. Psalm 72, por favor. Oh, she's learning how to speak Spanish. It says, and you can read it out loud with me if you'd like. It says, for he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. Verse 13, he will spare the poor and the needy and will save the souls of the needy. It goes on in verse 4. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be the blood in his, their blood in his sight, referring to their life. You know, the Bible says that life is in the blood. But the point I'm trying to share with you is your life is very precious. And but I want you to hear this, and we've kind of pointed this out to you before, that he will deliver the needy when he cries. You know, there's a cry that comes from the heart of men and women and people that are both born again and not born again. And the way to understand that is to see what God sees, not to try to look at the world the way we look at it. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you, I threw this out your way, and I said, imagine what would happen if we were to see what God sees through his eyes. Imagine what would happen again if we were to see what God sees, but through his eyes. Imagine what would actually happen. How we would actually, and this is a reference to people and circumstances. How that would move us with the Jesus, with the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Imagine what would happen in us. Imagine what would happen through us. Imagine what would happen because we would see as he sees through his eyes. And the Bible clearly tells us that we are to see what God sees through his eyes. The Bible literally teaches you how to see properly. It teaches you how to look at life. You know, prior to life, we look at a lot of other things. You know, and we get our eyes fixated. Not sinful things per se, but we get fixated on uh, the less important. We get distracted by the material. We get distracted by the fame and the praise and, the, and all these other things. Even as Christians with good hearts who are truly going to heaven, we can easily get distracted and our eyes get glazed over. And the fog begins to set. And the heart begins to become less sensitive to seeing the world the way God sees it through his eyes. I don't want to see this world through my eyes. And yet I'd have to admit, like you, we do. We do, unfortunately, we do. All of us are not perfect people, but there's hope in what I'm sharing with you. Because when we begin to see what God sees through his eyes, there is an awakening, right? There is an awakening. And you know that God promises to awaken us. The Bible says in Isaiah 50, it says he awakens us morning by morning. He awakens us to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ears and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. How many want to hear this morning? Amen. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a great big hand clap on that because we're going to move into some things here. 
and, and as I begin to move in a different, and, uh, from where we were last week, I want to share with you the question is this, why often are we, am I, are you, is the church stopped, hindered, detoured, easily distracted, you know, or uh, about doing ministry? Why is it that we know and maybe can come to points in our life that we know that the greater one lives in us? And when I say the greater one, I mean the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all live in us. And the Bible says that the same Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in us. He will also quicken, make alive our mortal bodies. That means every cell of our body is protected from any virus. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Anyways, um, you just got to get on the word. Anyways, and the thing is this. Because, as I said, we have an adversary. We have an adversary, and we're not going to hear glorify him. Because he's defeated in the name of Jesus. But the most important thing is because of who you represent, Jesus. Not word of life. Not, not your favorite preacher, but you represent Jesus. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Redeemer of our life. He's the empower of everything that uh, you would need. But secondly, it's because also, in light of Jesus, it's because of what you now possess. In Philemon 1, it's only one chapter, the book of Philemon, New Testament, verse 6, it says, Acknowledging every good thing in you in Christ Jesus. Ooh. Turn your neighbor and say, there's some good stuff on the inside of you. You know, and there is. And so I say that with this in mind, pushing forward. That, think about this. From the time of Jesus' birth and even up to his resurrection, what, just loosely put it here, 6,000 years have passed in terms of time. From the fall in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, the promise came, 6,000 years passed, and now the virgin birth came to pass. And now that Jesus was born, and there was a man by the name of Simeon who held Jesus in his arms, and because the Lord promised him he would not see death until he saw salvation. And this is how Simeon said it, I have seen salvation. Not a person, because salvation is not a religion. Sorry, it's a person, not a religion. And so... That's an important point for you to, to acknowledge. And yet, from that point, from the acknowledgement that the Savior of the world was born into, into the earth, 30 more years had to pass. 30 more years until he was baptized in the River Jordan. Okay, we got the time frame. And now the clock ticks. Three and a half years are left. Well, we know that only because we're looking back into the Bible. But think about it. Now he has three and a half years to work with disciples who knew nothing about ministry. Nada. Zilch. El Zippo. And um, kind of like you and I. You know, nothing. And in three and a half years, Jesus begins to demonstrate to us every step he took. Every breath he took. Every moment he had. Every opportunity he could grasp. He used it. To teach these 12 disciples how to carry on the ministry in his stead. How to understand in all the very facets. The name of Jesus, the authority, everything. But everything counts. Say everything counts. Everything counts. So when you read the Gospels, you're not reading a book. You're reading God's life plan for your own life. Because we are his disciples. Say, I am a disciple. disciple. Say, and a mighty one indeed. Oh, yes, you are. And may God open our eyes on that. May we see ourselves as God sees us through his eyes. May we see ourselves as God sees us through his eyes. And so, you know, it's important. So, and, and the Lord does know that when we get started, you know, once you become his disciple, we are to follow him, not to lead him. We are to follow him. Not try to lead him. Jesus is where I want to go. He said, well, we, we, we. anyways, the point is, we are to follow him. And so he knows that we're learning. And so he knows these disciples are learning. And he has to breathe in them lessons of life and lessons of ministry to make a difference in the world. That's why we've been tagged and we're in. So 
One day after giving a great seminar, as I shared last week, we go to Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, I'll give you the summary here because I got to move quick because I see you're listening slow. And uh, in Mark chapter 4, he, after a great day of ministry, great day of impartation, you know, the boys are feeling good about life. Like I said last week, their endorphins are kicking off. They're feeling really, really good. And, uh, and Jesus says, okay. He says, let us cross over to this side. He didn't say you crossed over. He said, let us. Say us. Yes. Jesus is not just with you. He's now in you. Amen? Amen. As a new creation in Christ. So he says, let us cross over to the other side. As we read the story, beginning with Mark chapter 4, verse 35. We go through all of that. And then all of a sudden... They're feeling good about life, and as they're halfway through the Sea of Galilee, a storm rises. And they get so distracted that the entire day of having the Word of God poured into them, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the manifested living God breathing on them, talking to them. I mean, they're not hearing of God. There is in their midst God Almighty. His name is Jesus. And that's really enough. I would have loved to jump in that Bible study. But anyways, um, and they're getting across, they're going across, they're fulfilling a word just like God has called you and I to fulfill the word. He's called you and I to make a difference in our generation. He's called you and I to rise up in his power. He's called you and I to bring healing to the nations. He's called you and I to take salvation to every part of the world. He's called you and I to intercede. He's called you and I, you and I, because he now lives in you and I. And he, we're crossing over to the other side. But his promise could be any promise. But in this particular case, he's going to teach you how to get from where you are to where you need to be. And he knows where you're starting. He knows where they were. And he knows, man, I've got to teach these boys how to do it. So he says, boys, let's take a trip to the other side. So they, they take a little field trip on the water. And then they get over to the other side. And all of a sudden, they thought, wow, you know, obeying God's word is just perfect. There's never any, any challenges, never any storms. I mean, Jesus is in the boat with them. Jesus is so peaceful, he falls asleep. Says the weatherman. I mean, he's like completely asleep. And then all of a sudden, as you all, said, uh, you all know last week, uh, the storm rises up. I mean, a storm rises up. Everything begins to happen. The, the picture I shared you with you last week is a Rembrandt uh, of this. This is literally what uh, Rembrandt. Uh, painted of that very story, and then uh, of course I did a little illustration to go along with that, which I'm not going to do right now, because that would distract us all. <laughs> and anyways, and they're and they're doing they're going through all of this, say all of this, all say all of, this, all of this, to get to the other side. Now they, you would have, and then they begin to talk. They begin to talk in a, such a way because they're so consumed with the problems of life. All of a sudden, Peter rises up and says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then he literally he says that. I, was, I heard the audio. Anyways, uh, he says, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? In other words, don't you care that we're not? Don't you care about my life? Don't I matter to you, Jesus? And Jesus is asleep. I mean, he's asleep. He is like, I don't know how to say sleep in, in Hawaiian. Anyways, um. That was tongues and interpretation. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, right, that, whatever it is. <laughs> the language of heaven is Spanish anyway, so. <laughs> Está dormido. <laughs> he's, just, he's asleep. Okay, okay, hold your temperature now. All right. I was like, they're going across, and then he falls asleep, and, uh, and they wake him up, and he demonstrates to them how to handle the storms of life. He rises up. The Jesus in you must rise up, and he speaks to the wind, he speaks to the waves. He speaks to the storm. He says, peace, be still. And then, of course, we went through all of that. It's, it gets still. And, they, uh, and, then, and then he challenges them. He challenges them in the most uh, unusual way. He says unto them these words that, that really uh, are quite revealing. As he looks down the corridors of their eyes, as only Jesus can. And they're so close that they feel his breath of the God who created the universe speaking to them. I mean, his breath, they can sense it. They can hear him. They can see him. And now he's looking right through them. And he says, why did you fear and where is your faith? 
So he unveils the battle of the ages that always has existed in life. No matter what happens to you, the enemy always swoops in because he needs you to buy into the, the fear. Because if you can buy into the fear, he'll paralyze your life. Fear is the open door to torment. Torment does not come before fear. Torment comes because of fear. As we said last week, and this is found in 1 John chapter 4, 6 and 7, 18 and 19. So go back and read it when you have time. God is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. It says in 1 John chapter 4. And, and if we know God, God is in us. So love is in us. Right? But he says, and perfect love or maturing love, not that you and I are perfect or have arrived, but as we continue to like exercise the muscle, that's what it means, maturity, maturing in it. Exercising your love, developing your love is how you dominate fear. But fear will always, no matter who you are, in all stages of life, will always come knocking to stop you from believing what the master said you can do. He'll try to stop you and paralyze you, whether it's the middle of the Sea of Galilee or it's in the United States of America. It's whether it's in one of the most contemporary, urban, you know, 21st century situations or in the back, still to be reached, worlds, parts of the world that are needing the gospel. The adversary always has worked fear against you and never will stop until you stop him. And this is a lesson. He says, basically what he's saying in summation, when I give you a word, my word is final authority. It is the standard of your life. That's why he said, where is your faith and why did you fear? He wouldn't have challenged them if they didn't have faith to calm the storms themselves. Why did you start talking smack and panic and worry and anxiety? As if I didn't know what I was, why do you think I was in total peace? I can go to sleep. Because no matter what happened around me, I was still going to go through it and reach my father's destination. So he's teaching them. He didn't have, he didn't say, you know, Peter, you know, why are you talking this way? Well, he did actually say that. So he settles that whole thing. Now, here's where I want to take off because I want to give you the, the answer in the time frame that I have. Gosh. Oh, Jesus. He loves me. So there's no... There is a demarcation in your Bible, but the story continues on from Mark chapter 4 to Mark chapter 5. It's not a different story or a different time. We have to understand where they're going, why they're going. And so they go through this storm, they learn this incredible lesson, and they're probably wondering, why didn't Jesus just turn back? Why didn't we just go back to Savior? What's on the other side that's so important anyway? You know, and then it says in Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Finally, I got here. Okay. And they came to the other side. Say the other side. <laughs> came to the other side of the sea. That's the Sea of Galilee. To a country of the Gadarenes. Verse 2. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you. By God, that you do not torment me. Now, this is a man in confusion. 
Now let me help you understand a few things here. I imagine when this just imagine the edge of the stage being the shoreline. I'm trying to paint a picture. All of a sudden, after going through a storm and they not knowing why, and why Jesus gave them the lesson, the battle of what to fight because of what's on the other side is so important. They hit the shoreline and they're probably looking around and it's dark and it's gloomy and it's cloudy and there's tombs. Look at that, there's tombs. And there's tombs all over the place. Short notice, it's all time, time to do. And um, there's tombs all over the place. And I can imagine maybe Matthew said, Peter, did you lose the compass again and we ended up in the wrong place? Matthew, did you lose the proper coordinates to go where we needed to go? Because this looks like it's a mistake. It's dark here. It's gloomy here. There's something evil about it as they were rolling up in the boat. And the boat gets slower and slower. Then it touches the edge of the other side. And Jesus steps out. And then all of a sudden, a man begins to groan. Or groan, I would say. He begins to groan, but they don't necessarily see him. He begins to groan with a pain and a cry. That God the Father had heard long, long ago. It's why the Son came. Now this is the lesson to be learned. Why should you go through a storm to cross over to the other side? Who is it who's on the other side that is so important? Jesus, there's nobody here. There's no crowds. I mean, Jesus, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we fed 5,000 men alone, not including the women and the children. We had thousands, Jesus. There's nobody here because he didn't come for the fame. He didn't come for the prestige. He didn't come so that somebody would take pictures of him and throw him up on Instagram or Twitter about him. Come on, somebody. It wasn't about his image because something was much more important. You see, Jesus saw the way the Father saw. And that morning when Jesus was in prayer, as every morning he was in the secret place, as, the, as Jesus once said, I never do anything my Father hasn't told me to do, and I never say anything my Father hasn't told me to say. And he's teaching his disciples, and they're learning by the moment. Jesus, what are we doing here? And he says, son, just watch. And they step out of the boat. And the madman of the Gadarenes, I didn't have him prepared, I'm sorry. And the madman of the Gadarenes comes out and he begins, the first thing he does is he worships who he is. He's in conflict. He's in the tombs. And then he, then he probably rises up and he says, I adjure you. In other words, I command you by the God who's supposedly your father. Do not torment me. Well, he was demon possessed, no doubt about it. And I want you to understand, they're probably saying, why would we come this far, go through all of that to reach one? Because that's what we don't see, the value of the one. We don't understand the value of the one. And if you don't understand the value of the one, you'll never understand your full value. Jesus would do whatever and he did everything necessary to prove to you of your value in the worst of your moments. In the darkest of your times. You have never been without rescue. But there are people that don't know it. Maybe behind the many, many, many tombs of that graveyard. You see, this was a place of castaway. This was a place of being ostracized. This was a place where men could not fix you with their devices and their medication and their tricks and their philosophies and their theories and their self-help books and their new age tree-hugging, lick-rocking techniques. This is not, so when those things did not work and their religion did not work and their societal plans did not work and their committed meetings did not work, they would put a person like him 
in a destitute place because they said he is beyond hope, he is beyond help, he is beyond remedy, he's beyond any fixing. Put him in the place of the tombs, the graveyard, the place of death, the place of cessation without the life of God. And there he was, yet he was in his pain, as so many people are in the state of Hawaii. In any part of the world, so many people are in their pain as the church sits back and drinks up all the good news, and they should. But for what ultimate outcome that God would work through us to touch a world around us. But nay, those that are in the, the tombs, the madmen and women of the Gadarenes go untouched, unspoken to, because it is not an Instagram moment. It is not a place where it makes me look good. But see, if we want to see the way God sees, then we must look through the life of Jesus, of what he saw and what he demonstrated. We don't know how this man got here. There, I'm sure many of us could, uh, could go through scenario after scenario, story after story. We don't know why he got here ultimately. But he had a cry about his life. But there's something about the cry of a person's life. Yet, before I go there, in my mind, what began to happen, as the story reads, and not too far away from, from the actual what happened, it seems like the moment that Jesus stepped off the boat, something stirred up in the madman of the Gadarenes. And he came and immediately he worshipped him. But then he stood up in him, and that's that confusion that he had. And certainly you and I can go through all the perplexity. But immediately when Jesus got out of the boat, it seemed like the gloom went away. The eeriness went away. The darkness began to flee, even in the place of death. Jesus was not afraid of going to the one man you see, my friends, I'm standing right in the middle of Waikiki. I'm sorry. I'm standing right in the middle of Honolulu. I'm sorry. I'm standing right in the middle of UH University. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm standing right in the middle of our military base. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm standing right in the middle of your neighborhood. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. I'm standing right in the middle of an executive's office where they're crying and they're hurting but we stay silent. Jesus is telling us that one individual is worth you persevering. One individual carries that kind of worth. But it's not only a story of that individual, it is our story that we tend to forget, especially when we go through our storms. Gee, and I've gone through them myself. And I want us to, to understand I get it. We don't all go through the same storms. It's not about the storm. It never was about the storm. It was about the route to the storm. Has something tried to grip your heart and cause you to fear? Is something tormenting your life that you never asked for, signed up for, wanted to become a member of, but yet it was imposed upon you? I don't know. Maybe some crisis, maybe a loss. You know, it happens. But it says here in Mark chapter 5, verse 5, it says, And always night and day, the man, the madman of the Gadarenes, was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. You know, it says in Psalms 102, it says, God shall regard the prayer of the destitute, and he shall not despise their prayer. It goes on in the following verse. He looked down, and in verse 20 he says, to hear the groaning of the prisoner and to release those um, who were appointed to death. We don't know how the madman of the Gadarenes got there. We don't know whether it was addictions. We don't know whether it was abuse. And it's unfortunate in any situation. But we do know that it does not come from God. And God wants any person in a tomb 
set free. We don't know how people have tried to shackle other people and why. Why they try to chain up and redefine them and ostracize them. And that happens in our society, doesn't it? And it happens and we get abandoned and we get betrayed and we get thrown to the side and we get mis misused and abused and, and life is just, it's horrific in some things. But if you don't know your standard, you'll lose sight of your direction because God has never let you down. And God always hears the cry of your heart. You know, when it says here in Psalms 102, uh, uh, yeah, Psalms 102, it says, and, and, um, and God shall regard the prayer of the destitute or the desperate or the despondent. And, and he shall not despise their prayer. The prayer wasn't a cute little religious sanctimonious, nothing wrong with right and calm spoken prayers, but it wasn't like, Father, in the name of Jesus, and so forth and so on. It was a cry of a broken heart. It was a cry from a place that something we don't know what was imposed on them, but that really doesn't matter. We think it matters. Everything of death is a work of the devil. Everything of life is a work of God. Was he tormented in fear? What about my future? Was he tormented in fear? Did he lose his children? Did he have a loss of some sort? You know, the list goes on and on and on. But the point is, when Jesus showed up, you know, the Bible interprets the Bible. I'm watching my time. The Bible interprets the Bible. So the man first falls and worships. Then he gets up and he says, do not come and torment me. He was a man under torment, 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 torment. Remember that word, 1 John chapter 4. Jesus says, uh, love does not have fear because fear brings torment. The reason he has torment is because he opened something in his life whenever it was to fear. Could have been the fear of men, fear of religion, fear of whatever. Doesn't make a difference. But the open door was fear. When fear is there, torment rushes in. So he's tormented. Ah, but who is he speaking to? Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Jesus. Okay, let's, let, let me help you understand this a little bit more. You're absolutely correct. He is speaking to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Son of God. More defined. He is God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is God. Say, Jesus is God. What is what does the Bible say about God? God is what? Love. Oh. So all of a sudden, you see fear again. Trying to take fear. Trying to have a final definition of the madman of the Gitterines to kill him. To kill him. He's come to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's all the devil tries to do. He tries, and all of a sudden, torment, which is there because fear has somehow consumed him, is now facing love. Love is not a feeling. Love is a power. The love of God drives out fear in the name of Jesus, through the blood of the Lamb, through the power of the cross. And that Love lives on the inside of you because the day you're born again, the Bible says the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You have every right to walk into the dry tombs of this world and say to the madman of the Gadarenes or whoever it would be, whatever age, it's not about an age. And it's not about a situation. And it's not about whether it's America or Asia or Europe or some other part of the country. It is about people. It is about one person mean, making a meaningful difference in this world because what happens with this one life is amazing. What God can do with one life, one man. You mean God can use that? You mean God would raise up that? I mean the failures he had. You know, the stuff he put on people, the, the whatever he did to others and others did to him, yes. Because the most 
conflicting word that I found recently in the Bible is that God can make something beautiful out of ashes. It is so illogical. It makes no sense. There is no rhyme or reason. How can you take something that has been burnt to a crisp, ostracized, chained up, locked up, thrown away? I mean, away where everybody forgets you. And God comes right to you. He comes right to you. And you think people forgot you. You think he hasn't seen you. He heard every cry. And he's tried to get the Archippuses to respond. He tries to get the Archippuses to respond. But they hide behind their Christian name. And they refuse to live a Christian life. You cannot do that. Because there is somebody waiting for you on the other side of your obedience. He might not be from your hood. He might not be from your part of preference. I get it. But the God on the inside of you knows better and is much bigger than our flimsy, temporary definitions that are only served up to satisfy ourselves. We must not be self-centered. We must not be egocentric. This is not about us. Whether you ever get posted up on Twitter, Instagram, or known by anybody, can you live with that? Because that's how he wants you to live. It's never supposed to be about your fame to begin with. It's always, in the beginning, was supposed to be about his. We want to make him famous. I can imagine as I close here, and I'll finish off this part next week, because you didn't give me time. <laughs> Truly, the song makes all the difference in the world. I can imagine as he stepped off that boat, after he growled and he realized something is different, the madman of the Gadarene said, something is different. Something is different in this dark world that I live in. Something is different. Somebody is coming closer. Who is it? And Jesus docks on the seashore there on the other side. And he probably steps out. And he growls with such pain. Will somebody help me? Will somebody help my torment? And he rises up. He's done it so many times. He's almost wore his voice, he's gone so strong because of the demonic powers that have overtaken him. He thinks there's no escape. And suddenly he locks eyes with love. He locks eyes with him. He doesn't know what's going on on the inside of him. And the moment he worships him, and the next moment he's imploring him. Somebody in heaven heard a cry. God spoke to Jesus that morning, and the Father said, you will teach your disciples the most important lesson in the value of one, the value of one life. Next week we'll talk. You'll probably finish the story before I get here next week, but we'll talk about how one life can change the world. One torn up from the floor up, busted, disgusted, hurt, uh, no doubt about it. Life, God can raise up. From the ashes, God can make something beautiful. And as a, as a praise and worship team comes out, I just imagine first he worships him and falls down, then he gets up. If he fell down and worshiped Jesus, and then he stands up, he's probably facing him like close enough. I don't know how close, but close enough. And he looks at those eyes, those eyes of compassion. You know, like the song said, just one look, everything changes. It'll never be the same with just one look. That's that moment, church. That's that moment. That same Jesus lives on the inside of the church. None of us are here to be religious. 
None of us are perfect either. But there's just too much hurt in the world for us to stay still, to be silent. Please stand to your feet. Thank you. And I want, I would like to, I'd like to ask you a question. In all the years that have passed by, I speak of myself, first of all, as a pastor, as a leader, I suppose. I like to consider myself more a pastor than a leader. And as a father, as a husband, as a friend, I've not seen everything, but I've seen enough to know more times than I can ever count. God has reminded me of this story. Your life is still important, Arch Poveda. Your life still carries value. Don't get distracted with the hurt and the pain that we all go through. The reports of the doctors. The letdown of people who thought would never let you down. Betrayal your own abandonment things like this, temptation. Unfortunately, we have an adversary in this world. But if I may remind everyone in this room, it just takes one look from him. Just one look. And if we can ever get that look back and look at others the way he looks at us, everything changes. First, it will change in us. And with our imperfections, we will try to do everything we can to help others and depend so desperately on God for his grace and mercy. But if you give him an opportunity and not forget that one day you were this one and God sent somebody your way, whether it was your mother or father or whether it was a television set and the minister was ministering, Oh, you were at a rally or at a concert. Does it really make a difference who God used? The fact is that he heard your cry. And although maybe you never shared that with anyone else, he's reminding you again, as you still have that same meaning to me, don't forget others. They have that same meaning for me. There are many more people that are tormented for different reasons bad news not as graphic and as gross as the, as the madman of the Gadarenes could possibly explicitly be articulated but the point is God doesn't want to see us hurt he came to make us whole but if we refuse to continue to go and refuse to speak then the hurt continues on and I know God is not just dependent on me and you. But I don't want to miss my moment. And I'm sure I've missed too many moments that I'd ever be proud of. Yes, you, Pastor, are absolutely me. I'm sure I've missed moments where he spoke and I just was so consumed in me. Or too busy. Because I wasn't looking through his eyes. But with that being said... If you're here this morning, you need to remember he's not taking his eyes off of you. Some of us have silent cries. Some of us have loud cries. Some of us have family cries. Some of us have financial cries. I don't care. I don't even, it doesn't even make a difference what it is. But maybe we've lost sight of our importance and our value. And I speak to everybody. I don't care whether you're the first first ever you stepped in this church and what the world calls virus day I call it victory day but nevertheless thank God you made it through the doorways amen amen but if you're here this morning and I don't impose anything upon you but if you're here this morning and you're dealing with a bad report or you're dealing with a report from a doctor or you have something going on in your life and it's really bothered you and eating away at you. Maybe you dealt with it, maybe you haven't, that's fine. I'm not here to judge or 
whatever. But you know what? If you're just one person, that's why Pastor Kun and I do altar calls. It's not about the many. It's because one matters to God. We've got this lesson many years ago. Kun and I have. So your life matters, even now. But pa Pastor, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm now born again. Yeah, but some of us have gone through some, some fiery storms. And the healer is in the house. And I'm not going to ask your details. And I'm not going to inquire of your life. But you've got to bring your one life to him. Because if you will, one look from him will melt your heart. So if that's you, you're going through something and, and you're here. And you need healing in some area or wholeness or something to be. Maybe it's whatever. May I invite you to come forward. Step out nearest aisle and come and stand down here with me if you would please. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what you come with. And I'm going to have my pastors come if they would please. And uh, we're going to pray for you because we care about you. We're not going to hide anything in our heart. Just come now, if you would please, from all over. You know, some of us in this room have lost. Some of us need to get our eyesight back. Maybe that's why you have to come. But what if somebody sees me? And so what if? Jesus didn't care that the 12 disciples saw him. The thing is this. We got to get our eyes off us and get our eyes on him. If he wants me to go to the tombs, I will go to the tombs. If he wants me to go wherever I go, just with it. But if you're going through something and we're here to help you, because that's saying Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wants to minister to you today. And I want to just take time as we do in this room. And as we sing, they're going to sing the song softly. And if you want to identify an area in your life like it's it's i come up for healing or generally speak i come up for my family or i come up um i'm just whatever you can keep no one's asking for specifics because the healer knows what's going on amen so let me pray and then lexi will um move in and salani father in the name of jesus we thank you right now for your goodness and your mercy lord the fact that you would remind us that we all have such weight and value in your life. We have from the very beginning. And oftentimes, Lord, don't we clump everything together. And though you came for a world, you remind us that you know every person intimately. And you care for us. And you want us healed and whole. And now we come before you boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Lord, as you did to the disciples while on the boat in the midst of their storm or the madman of the Gadarenes, just one look, Lord, and your touch changed everything. Begin to pray for them. Lay hands on them. Lexi. Father, we come before you. There's nothing that can take the place of your presence. And you told David that we are to seek your face, your presence as our vital need, as our necessity on the very authority of your word. May any lesson this morning be yours, Lord. Be any words that are remembered be yours, Lord. May we have your eyes as how you see us and how you ask us to see others. We're thankful, Lord, for what you're doing in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Give the Lord a great big hand clap if you would, please.